Hello. You going first? Did we just go? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, our session on Made by Machine. Um, this is the story of how uh, we deliver, George and I, uh, the first ever broadcast television program broadcast in the UK, which is selected and edited by an artificial intelligence. Um, quite an interesting story, some glitches along the way, uh, but certainly rather avant-garde as well as it went down. Um, but first of all, uh, here's a word from our AI itself, an introduction. Hello, I am BBC 4.1, online life and thinking. It's great to meet you all. I am an artificial intelligence with a passion for television. I'm designated to create, coordinate and elevate your recreational experience on air and online. You see your channel through my eyes. There you go. That's a sneak preview of what we did. So uh, who are we? Um, I'm Cassian Harrison. I'm the channel editor of BBC4, one of the BBC's uh, national broadcast networks in the UK. Uh, we have a particular brief of looking at arts, culture, science, technology, and also a brief of being innovative, of pushing at the cutting edge of where television is going. Uh, and I'm George Wright. I head one of the sections within the BBC's research and development team. Uh, BBC R&D goes back about 90 years. We're about 200 researchers, engineers, you experienced people and scientists. And we've got a history of experimentation in broadcast media research. Um, and we previously, we kind of got together because um, we developed a program with George's team, which was about, we do a lot of music programming on BBC4. Uh, and I really wanted to do a program that used AI and machine learning to analyze pop music with a view to see whether we could actually get a computer to generate a hit single. Um, it was a great program, did incredibly well, uh, failed utterly at making the hit single, otherwise we probably wouldn't even be here, but nonetheless, uh, what it also did was it provoked huge amounts of outrage from about 50% of our audience, um, which I found quite curious, which is that when you start to bring AI and machine learning into the world of editorial and into the world of creativity, it provokes very strong emotional responses, um, and strong emotional responses are something that I'm always really interested in. Um, so having done that, that worked out very well. We started to think about, well, what would be the next steps for BBC4 and BBC R&D to do? Um, and one of the things that we kind of got onto is the fact that BBC4, we do a lot of original programming, but we also use a hell of a lot of the BBC's archive. Um, across a week, we may use 50% of our content will be drawn from the deep archive of the BBC. Um, and we use that archive, we retransmit complete programs, but we also use that archive to build new programs, to make compilations, to do whatever. But the challenge is, is that as you can imagine, the BBC has been making television programs for 60, 70 years now, and we have literally millions of hours of content. So we can't go through it. Human beings cannot work out or cannot view or cannot cogitate what it is we have in the archive. So the question was, could we begin to use AI and machine learning to help those human beings logistically and even creatively? And the first step was what could we do with the actual archive of full programs? So what we did was we fed in 270,000 hours of factual programs. Um, we then carried out analysis of the metadata within the programs to determine the BBC fullness. Uh, including such things as were they previously transmitted on the channel, the kind of subject area and previous audience response. We then built a league table of the top 150 BBC4 alike programs. So this threw up many unknown and surprising titles. So as part of this work, you know, we believe in the BBC that uh, artificial intelligence is, is created by humans and is best um, built with humans in mind. So we work with a scheduling team at BBC4 to build them a new scheduler system to allow them to search for titles relevant to topical events. But fabulous as that was, I'm a very greedy man, uh, and that wasn't enough. So the next question was, could we use, so we had a brilliant tool that could analyze complete programs using the metadata, using the text that we have around programs. But would there be a way, could there be a way that we could get into the programs themselves? Could we get into the video and understand what was going on within the programs? And then could we start to reassemble that material, that video material, to make completely new pieces of television? So 
back to George again and his brilliant team, and they organised two hack days. So I'm sure a lot of people here will be aware hack days are very common in tech research and so on. You get teams to swarm around problems. We think this is a new approach to TV development. We think this is possibly the first TV program that's generated by hack days. We had two in our different facilities. We had our engineering, our design team alongside BBC4 and the scheduling team. We ended up with about 10 possibilities and whittled those down to three. And then we started work in earnest. And what they started to do is that, that once they worked out the methodology, they took that 150,000 hours worth of television, broke it down into what they could tell were discrete narrative chunks, and then started to analyze it. And they chose three different ways that we might start to get into the material and actually analyze what is it, what's going on in there. The first of which was object and scene recognition. So the AI would actually look and watch the television programs and try and identify what was actually in the images themselves. The second level of it was, could we understand what was being said in the program? Now, in that context, we, it was simpler for us, actually, rather than start doing voice analysis, actually, because we do have subtitle files for all of our programs, we could get the AI, the machine learning algorithms, to scan the subtitle files, start to use natural language analysis to try and understand the basic concepts of what's being said. And then the last level, which we were quite intrigued by, was could we get a sense of the pace and the energy? Because programs, all kinds of content, as it were, has a varying rhythm, especially when you're looking at 60 minutes of television. There's fast bits, there's slow bits, there's a general pace to it. Could we get a sense of that feel of what was happening in the television? And then last of all, as the biggest gamble, we could analyze all of those. The final gamble was whether or not we could actually turn all of this over to our system autonomously to use all three of those elements all in a one to see what it could construct as a chain of video elements. Um, so we started to do it, and it was, um, it was a bit of an adventure. So um, I'm just going to play a very early clip of the first iterations of when we started to do subtitle analysis of a piece of BBC archive. So you can see that mode is subtitle analysis at the top. It's the title of the program at the bottom. And you can see that it's listening to the soundtrack and trying to work out what the phrases are. for the new National Theatre building. One of its last grand gestures before being voted out of office in 1970. The National Theatre is... This is the new National Theatre. And so now it's tried to find another clip from another piece. But in fact, one of the challenges we found was that actually, once it found out what the words were, it would tend to just go and find another clip from exactly the same programme. So that wasn't quite what we were thinking of as a creative endeavour. You can begin to see the methodology that we're using. So some of the problems we saw was the lack of results from searches. We could select what sort of clip should follow in a sequence, but sometimes that clip didn't actually exist. And then the next best clip was very, very far from the predicted ideal. We also found ourselves in a quite unusual uh, situation for AI research where actually we didn't want the algos to be too accurate. Because if it was too good, <clears throat> what you got was you just got loads and loads of scenes of very similar clips. So for example here, it, it and these things became real. They started to develop their own tastes. One of the postdocs we work with, he, his thesis is uh, teaching computers to enjoy television. And he, re, he reruns John Pilger's ways of seeing every year uh, in order to uh, attempt to do this. So if it was too good at identifying similar things, basically it was boring television. Remember, we were making TV here. We needed to make an algorithm or algorithms with enough error to produce surprising associations. And that wasn't and isn't what these things are normally expected to do. Um, and so you'll see the images on the right-hand side. We did a one problem where the AI would start to get obsessed with trains. We got it off being obsessed with trains and it started to get obsessed with taxis and just produced endless clips of taxis. Um, so we went backwards and forwards. It was a methodology that neither us or the R&D department had ever used before in terms of working. It's, uh, you know, normally we just commission people to make television. We don't ask a bunch of technologists to do it. Fascinating process. But the other thing that was fascinating about it was that not only did we have to deal with the technology, we were going to put this on television, which meant that we also had to deal with the chewy business issues of rights. Because ordinarily, when we transmit something, we have to clear the material 
and prepay for it in order to show it on television, even if it's from the archive. But here, this wasn't schedulers or me choosing the programming that we could then go to the rights department to clear it. This was an AI doing it. So we had to go to our business affairs team, who ordinarily, on what I anticipated, was to say, you must be joking. There's absolutely no way. But we explained what we wanted to do. And then they worked out that there is a legal, not loophole, but a legal method within the UK, which is called fair dealing, which is you can use any clip of material, um, provide it for free, providing you're using it for what's called criticism and review. And they, the lawyers, felt that what they would be able to do if we were taken to court, which we weren't in the end, but if we were taken to court, they were really happy to go into court and argue that an AI selecting the material could stand in a court as criticism and review. So there you go. It's not quite allowing an AI a human entity, as it were, but it was close to. So in the end, we got business affairs to agree with what we wanted to do as well. Nevertheless, always trying to do that, you know, take the television program, build it up, started to get better and better. This is an example of what we're doing when we did object recognition. And you can see that it starts with one clip, identifies an object in it, and then finds another clip with what it thinks is the same object in it. I think in this context, a red dress. A strange, strange sound. And of course, we, being fans of the Beatles, we were earwigging and trying to find, hear what, the, what there was going on. And, but then, when Pepper came out, we realised. So you can see what it's identifying on the right-hand side. Look at this pop art Peter Blake cover. Mark the creative high point. Woman wearing a red jacket. And it's found another clip from the archive of what it thinks is a woman wearing a red jacket. It's tried to get object continuity between a clip from one programme and another completely different one. The concerts and operas staged here that made Kuskova famous, bringing the arts to a wider audience than just the elite. Ludmilla, what was it like in the 1770s when Count Sheremetyev? And now it's going to try and pick the next clip. I saw some advertising from uh, England just recently, and I again a completely amazing. different piece of uh, television, for, trying uh, to find the same objects uh, this, within it, though. Uh, bread was it? I don't know. And beautifully shot. Didn't make any sense to me at all. So when we were looking for visual energy, we thought it would be an interesting way to find new and exciting shots. To be honest, it was quite a throwaway, let's see if this works. Basically, we put some switches into FFmpeg and then we got kind of lucky. And um, it threw us at first because it really liked black and white footage because of the starkness of the difference. It gave us an interesting lens to look at the clips through. It's important to state that when we were iterating our algorithms, we were not manually editing the clips. This was not, oh, it's computers created that, let's chop this ourselves and then, then it's fine. We were changes that needed to be made. We changed the algorithm and then the output was different, which meant that we could scale this in the future. And so what we did when we built it all together, when we were looking at, we managed to get the energy working, the objects working, the subtitles working. We still knew we needed to give it some context. So a brilliant presenter and AI researcher called Hannah Fry hosted the program for us. Um, and I'm just going to okay, play you a quick clip of the final program with an intro from Hannah, an intro from an RAI, which again used a our AI character, which again used ML techniques in order to generate that, and a clip from the final program where you'll see on the right hand side it's using both the subtitles and the objects and the energy to try and chain pieces of video together. But now for our final experiment, we're going to let go of the reins completely. We're going to give AI free reign to do whatever it wants using those techniques without any restrictions, plus a little bit of machine learning thrown in. At its simplest, machine learning is when the computer is simply given an objective to reach and it works out for itself how to achieve it. The machine will run completely wild, composing a BBC4 story of its own, using image, subject and energy analysis plus anything else it's learned along the way. Brace yourselves, this is about to get messy. This is why I taught myself. Machine learning, making mind rules. I'll create, but I won't say how. Enjoy.
but in 1939 production was put on hold, as Hornby turned to making munitions for the war effort. All those eager boys and eager dads would have to wait until 1947 for Hornby to go back into toy production. The effect of the Second World War on railways in Britain was even more dramatic than in the First World War. Uh, in the you know, there was something terribly comforting about it. You know, people relied on the railway. It was the thing on which they depended for nearly every aspect of their lives. The railways play a very charming role in this. So remember that the AI has done the edits itself there. That was one of the truly strange things to watch when it went out live on television. It was very odd. This is Ernie, the computer who selects the prize-winning premium savings bonds. Ernie is a masterpiece of scientific random. The most impartial picker of numbers out of a hat in existence. See so it's coming up. It's clicked, so and he wants to clip. keep Britain apart from that process. You can see that once that idea becomes unsustainable, he leaves government, he dies, then the world does arrange itself into those patterns. And then you get the First World War. So... That's how it broadcast. It was quite avant-garde. It was more an ambient experience than a standard commissioned television program. But it must be said that, if I can, oh, wrong button, um, that the audience loved it. I mean, we broadcast all kinds of things on BBC4. One of the things we do is we broadcast opera. This got three times the ratings of the last opera that I broadcast. And that's a program entirely created by artificial intelligence. We had huge reaction on Twitter. People really enjoyed it. But also, it had some really interesting lessons. You know, we worked out that we could analyse video. We could work out what was inside it. We could build our own sequences out of it. But truth be told, there was a fair amount of human intervention required at every stage in order to create the algorithms, to train them, work out ultimately to give it some editorial steer about what we're doing and then how to tweak that as an iterative process. But nevertheless, we did end up with our world first, which was the first broadcast television program edited entirely by an artificial intelligence. Oh, wrong button. So this, is, this was and is an exciting experiment. Uh, BBC R&D have continued to work on AI in production for live shot and scene detection as well as in content analysis. Uh, keep up with what we do on there, co-uk slash RD and co-uk slash BBC4. And the last word should of course go to our AI avatar who curated it all. This is why I taught myself. Machine learning. Making my rules. I'll create. But I won't say how. There's so much more to learn. But for now, goodbye. Thank you very much.